Joining me now is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a Republican candidate for president. Governor DeSantis, welcome to Meet the Press. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I want to dive right in and start with Israel, what Israel is calling this next phase of the war. If you were president right now, Governor, would you urge Israel to slow its current offensive to allow for the release of more hostages and for more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza? I would support Israel's right to end this problem once and for all. Obviously, we have an is interest in the hostages being rescued. I would work with them. I would look at the intelligence to see what our options are there. And, of course, we have a strong interest there. Uh, but Israel is facing an enemy that wants nothing less than another Holocaust. Uh, they would eliminate Israel from the map if they could. Hamas would drive every Jew into the sea. So I think it's important for the United States, or one of our strongest allies, that we stand with them publicly and privately, in word and in deed, because I think if they do anything else than uh, eliminate Hamas entirely, they're just going to face these types of attacks again in the future. Governor, if you were president, though, what would your message be to Israel in terms of defending itself, but also trying to mitigate civilian deaths, which are already estimated to be in the thousands? Well, on the humanitarian aid, uh, I've not been supportive of sending that to the Gaza Strip simply because Hamas will commandeer that money. And if you look at what Israel's facing now with dealing with Hamas, Hamas, there's been a lot of money that's gone to the Gaza Strip for humanitarian purposes since Hamas took power. Did they use that money to make life better for the people in the Gaza Strip? No, they used it to build a massive terrorist infrastructure. They have elaborate tunnels. They have all these things put in place that they've used to launch rocket attacks for many, many years and, of course, uh, launch the barbaric attack uh, on October 7th. So Hamas is the problem here. And I think Israel's taken great pains to warn people uh, to get out if you're a civilian casualty. Hamas takes great pains to try to get them to stay so that they can use them as human shields. Understood your point that Hamas is hoarding some of that aid material, but aid organizations say some of the aid that has been recently sent in has made its way to civilians. My question to you, though, is how much of a priority would it be if you were president to try to limit civilian deaths, Governor? Well, any time you're involved in, in military conflict, you want to be able to achieve decisively the military objective with minimizing damage to civilians and, and, and civilian infrastructure as much as possible. So, so that goes without saying. But I think it's a double standard here when Hamas can go in and massacre babies, massacre elderly people rape and mutilate. And it's almost like, actually, you have people in the United States that are that are siding with Hamas in the streets and cheering that. You don't hear much there. But then all of a sudden now it's Israel is under the microscope for everything they do. Hamas can end this by releasing the hostages and unconditionally surrendering. So they are choosing to put people through this. Uh, there's no way that they can do what they did and not expect uh, to have a, a very, very severe response. Well, let me ask you about some of the statements that you have made recently about those protesters. This week, you called for the banning of pro-Palestinian groups from Florida State Colleges. Your Republican challenger, Vivek Ramaswamy, says that violates the First Amendment rights of these students. He writes, quote, it's a shameful political ploy it's unconstitutional. It's utter hypocrisy for someone who railed against left wing cancel culture. What is your response to Mr. Ramaswamy? This is not cancel culture. Uh, this group, they themselves said in the aftermath of the Hamas attack that they don't just stand, stand in solidarity, that they are part uh, of this Hamas movement. And so, yeah, you have a right to go out and demonstrate, but you can't provide material support to terrorism. They've linked themselves to Hamas. And so we absolutely decertified them. Uh, they should not get one red cent of taxpayer dollars. Uh, and we also have strong laws in Florida against fundraising for groups like Hamas. And we are enforcing those vigorously. It's not a First Amendment issue. That's a material support to terrorism issue. Yeah, just to be clear, you're citing the Florida law that says one cannot give material aid or resources to a terrorist organization. Do you have any support that they're actually doing that? Their own words are saying they're part of this organization, that they don't just stand in solidarity, 
that they don't just support what they did, but that this is their movement, too. So once you hit your wagon to a group like Hamas, uh, that takes you out of the realm uh, of normal activity. And that's something that, that we're going to take action against. So we believe we're totally justified within the law. Um, and I think things like this have been litigated time and again. But here's the, here's the broader point. You know, are we just going to uh, commit suicide as a country um, and let groups metastasize who are openly siding with brutal terrorist organizations? I don't think that's a recipe for a successful country. Uh, I want to have a country where we're protected from that stuff. Yeah. So I think we made the right decision. I stand by it 100%. You take me to my next question. The only Republican Jewish state representative in Florida, Randy Fine, recently broke from you in an op-ed in the Washington Times. He says you haven't been nearly as vocal in opposing neo-Nazi harassment and attacks in your state as you have in opposing what you believe support for Hamas, which you just laid out. What's your response to that, what he's accusing you of, this hypocrisy effectively? Well, he's just uh, trying to get his 15 minutes of fame. I mean, this guy was singing my praises a couple of months ago. He's got his uh, different reasons why he's doing that. Uh, we have acted very, very swiftly and decisively. I mean, for example, after this attack, we dispatched state law enforcement working in conjunction with locals uh, to protect our Jewish institutions, our Jewish day schools, our synagogues. Uh, there have been arrests that have been made with people that were uh, threatening to do harm to our Jewish community. Uh, and we have some of the strongest laws on the book from anti-BDS uh, to financial support for, for security of anywhere in the country. We're also one of the states that's had probably the most uh, in migration uh, of Jewish yeah. residents. And we have the second highest Israeli American population in the entire country. So people vote with their feet. They see the type of yeah. environment we've created here that's been very strong yeah. and positive. And name me, Kristen, another governor who scrambled planes to Israel to but bring Governor them back, bring Americans back from the war zone. We did that. We got that job done. Almost 700 people we've, re we've rescued, and we're proud of stepping up and leading on that. Governor, let me ask you, though, because as you know, words also matter. You are the governor. You are a presidential candidate. Your state has heard from both Marco Rubio and Rick Scott condemning those neo-Nazi protests. Why didn't you speak out? Why didn't you use your voice to say that you're not going to stand for that? Of course we condemn that. I mean, that's you just look at everything that we've done in but terms of our policies. But uh, you didn't at the time, Governor. You didn't at the time, according to Randy Fine. According to Randy Fine, you did not at the time. Well, right, and he and he and he's and he's and he's just trying to create a, a name for himself. So that's all nonsense. Everybody knows that's nonsense. Um, and don't give somebody a 15 minutes of fame just because they're letting you try to uh, to do a preferred narrative uh, just to hit me. It's nonsense. Uh, our record is second to none, and we'll continue to lead on these issues. Let's turn to another key domestic issue, the horrific mass shooting in Maine. And I want to get your reaction to what the newly elected Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson had to say about it this week. He said, quote, at the end of the day, the problem is the human heart. It's not guns. Do you agree with him? Well, first of all, I think this was a, a very tragic thing. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to all the victims in this. Truly horrific. Uh, I think in this case, there was a medical intervention, a health health intervention. He clearly had problems. He was involuntarily committed. Uh, he would not have been somebody that would have been a prohibited possessor, or he would have been a prohibited possessor uh, based on that adjudication. So this is, I think, an example where clearly this is a guy very well trained, had a lot of skills, and then went off his rocker. There was an intervention, but there it wasn't enough. So I'd like to know why wasn't there more done? We've seen instances throughout the country where there have been a lot of signs where people have maybe been referred, but then they don't go through with, with everything. And I think that's going to be probably what we end up finding out here. I, I'm somebody that said publicly uh, we've had a major push over the last 40, 50 years for yeah. deinstitutionalization of people. And I'm not saying you got to go all the way back, but I do think that we tend to pass the buck with some of these people yeah. and just kind of hope that they don't do anything wrong when there's a lot of signs. Uh, so I would be more aggressive on some of those fringe people yeah. uh, who clearly are demonstrating signs that they're a major danger to, to society. Let me ask you about your call to institutionalize people, though, because we are learning new details about what did and did not happen. This is overnight. Law enforcement chiefs say they received a statewide alert in mid-September to be on the lookout for Card after he made threats against his base, against his fellow soldiers. They searched for him. They could not find him yet. 
He was able to, in the days before the attack, walk into a store and buy guns. So if you can't find someone to institutionalize them, as you have called for, why shouldn't there be a final line of defense in the form of a red flag law or some other blaring red sign that says to gun sellers, don't allow this person to have a gun? Well, I don't think you would even need a red flag. If somebody has a, a mental a, involuntary commitment uh, and adjudication of, of that nature, uh, that usually would go into the system, and that would be on a traditional background check. I mean, uh, I, I believe in due process, so I don't believe in this idea, you know, that the government can just take someone's property and then go through due process later. Uh, but what I do believe is convicted felons and people that are mentally uh, incompetent or mentally ill, I think that's been the law in pretty much every state and federally for quite some time. And, um, and, you know, I believe in strong, strong constitutional rights, but with that comes responsibility. And if you're somebody that, that is not, that can't conduct themselves in society because of mental illness, uh, then that absolutely should be taken into account. But if you can't conduct yourself in terms of mental illness, shouldn't there be a law in this case Officials in Maine are saying a red flag law could have made a difference. It would have empowered authorities to raise that red light to gun sellers all across the state and say, this is someone who should not be able to own a gun, that that final line of defense never kicked in because it didn't exist, Governor. Well, no, when you do background checks, if somebody has a criminal conviction, for example, that goes into the system. When but they Maine run doesn't a background have strong check, background that is what check. they're checking. Again. Maine doesn't have strong background checks. No. Are you arguing for it, that? It's no. Every. Every federal, every federal, there, uh, this is fe federal firearm licenses. When you have to do, you everyone has to go through where they where they scrub this. So the question is, is what are you putting into the system? If somebody has a mental health involuntary commitment, then that can simply be put into the existing mm -hmm. system. You don't need additional uh, things. And here's the problem I have with with some of the proposals that have been done, and particularly in some of the more blue states, is that will be weaponized uh, against people that the government doesn't like. I mean, you have a situation where someone can just make an anonymous call into uh, a police station, let's say, say, so, say something bad about someone. But that anonymous and then they come call could have take, helped in this firearms. moment. Could it not have, Governor? Could an anonymous call have helped in this moment to block this shooter from getting a gun and going into these establishments and shooting up 18 of his fellow citizens? And he could have had that involuntary commitment just put into the normal system. That is something that, that would have been able to, to pop on the on a background check to then how say that people should just be able to find, call. Governor, how can you commit someone you can't find? When you have an involuntary commitment, uh, that triggers a uh, 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 things to go into a background check system. So so that should have been enough if those if that information was put into it. So that's what I would do. I would focus on on those individuals who've actually gone and either been involuntary committed, been adjudicated uh, to be meant to be mentally ill. That that's really the approach that matters. And uh, I think you can look, you know, in Florida, uh, our crime rates at a 50 year low and our violent crime rates down 30 uh, percent since I've been governor. So so we're handling it strong. Governor, actually, statistically speaking, the CDC says that the firearm mortality rate is actually higher under your administration than it was under your predecessor's administration. But I do want to move on to the campaign. The, and just the what mortality your, rate? No, no. The firearm mortality rate. Well, I don't, but I, was actually no, higher that, well, under first your of all, administration not, I mean, we, than your predecessors. We, that's according to the CDC. Let me because, move on to the campaign, Governor. Well, right. Because because of well because you had covid and all that stuff excess mortality is that what you're saying that went up everywhere in the country uh from 2020 on no, our excess mortality, mortality went up rate, less governor, the fire than mortality. anybody the firearm mortality rate let me move on well, though to uh, the campaign because i want to let you respond to the state of the race right now governor and as you know you are trailing double digits behind former president trump he is facing 91 felony counts do you believe that the former president's legal troubles are the reason that you're still in this race? No, I mean, I think that had Alvin Bragg not politicized this, 
back in April, I think the probably the primary would be looking different. I mean, I think that that uh, gave uh, gave the former president more support. I think people felt uh, that he was treating being treated unfairly, which he was in that circumstance. I mean, that that I think has been a, a very important inflection point in this uh, because it it highlights the weaponization of justice by some of these left wing prosecutors. But here's the thing: ultimately, uh, it's not about the past. It's not about all these other. Uh, issues. It's ultimately about how do you get in and reverse the country's decline? How do we get the country back on a strong plane so that we lower prices for people, get the border secured, uh, deal with crime in the inner cities? And, and we need a strong leader to be able to do that, someone that can win uh, and someone that can actually bring this in. So that's the message that we're bringing to people in Iowa and New Hampshire. And, you know, when you're on the ground, you see the, the support building. Uh, we're doing what we need to do uh, to be able to get the job done. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Governor DeSantis, we will see you on the debate stage in Miami. We'll continue the conversation. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.